uh, I'm here to introduce Sanjay uh, Reddy. He's really the world expert on nuclear matter. So I was thinking about how to explain, you know, you know, his brilliance in terms of thinking about a phenomena that is, you know, orders and orders of magnitude above anything that we, you know, can do on Earth. So I, you know, I, I, I thought of telling you a little bit about density and, and tell you about surface density. So, you know, water in some units is density of one. So let's think about surface density of population on Earth. So water will be, you know, one person in the entire Earth. Then, you know, in the lab, we can achieve densities in a stable way that are about a million times higher than water. So you can imagine, well, put a million people on Earth and you get about one person in the entire city of Denver. You know? And that's more or less experimentally the limits of humanity. And then in a neutron star, you have to put you know, 10 to the 14. So the density is 10, you know, a one followed by 14 zeros, which is equivalent to have about a million people in the city of Aspen. Yeah, and you know, I actually look. What is the so Macau has the highest density, which is a hundred thousand. So it's you know, as humanity, we're only a factor of ten from getting fourteen orders of magnitude in surface density in population. So basically, what it's you know, some of the brilliance of Sanjay is that he basically extrapolates the laws of physics, orders of orders of magnitude from what we know in the lab, and he can make extremely robust predictions. I'm not going to tell you too much about his life because it's really beautifully portrayed in the leaflet, but he did his undergraduate at the University of Delhi. He then moved to the Indian Institute of Technology and did his PhD at Stony Brook. Uh, he was an MIT at Los Alamos uh, before he's now a professor in University of Seattle. And University of Seattle has probably one of the highest concentrations of nuclear astrophysicists in a beautiful institute which is called Institute of Nuclear Theory, and that's what uh, that that's where he is. Uh, when I was having a beautiful dinner uh, a couple nights ago with uh, with people from Aspen, they were asking, "Well, how is it that you know when you introduce individuals, you only talk about their accomplishments and know who they are as individuals?" And you know, I just thought that I should mention that you know Sanjay is an incredibly kind and thoughtful uh, individual. I had the pleasure of co advise a student with him, and the student just kept talking about you know, his brilliance and his ability to just nurture talent. And I'm really, really honored to have the pleasure of introducing Sanjay here. He's also the proud father of two beautiful daughters and you know, an amazing human being. So he has it all. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Enrico, for those very kind words. What I want to talk to you about today is an event that we anticipated, but what we saw just blew us away. We, I think this is the most interesting phenomena we've watched since we started seeing the skies. So that's why I think this is the ultimate collision. It's the collision of two neutron stars, and I'll describe neutron stars in just a moment. But what you're about to see in this movie, which was very nicely put together by people at NASA, is a depiction of what happens when you get two neutron stars together. So I want you to just watch this, because to some extent, what you're seeing is what we think really happened, and we have the data to back it up. So just watch this. There are two objects, roughly about the size of Aspen City, that are going around each other at the speed of light, and they are going to slam together, produce a lot of debris that you see there, and a spectacular electromagnetic signal, and then a jet that produces a gamma ray burst. And we've come to this conclusion because we have amazing instruments that can look at the sky, and because we have amazing theorists who kind of understood what this should do by doing computer simulations, by running calculations. So this is just one of those things. It's a triumph for all of physics, for observers, for theorists, and it's a story that I am just really excited to tell you about. So, but we'll have to begin by thinking about when was the word neutron stars first uttered and by whom? I mean, there are two brilliant astronomers here, and I'm told that one of them was eccentric and a little obnoxious. You can try to guess which one it was. <laughs> but you start with, this is 1934. I want you to think about 1934. This is two years after the neutron was discovered. And 
this brilliant statement just says, with all reserve, we advance the view that a supernova represents the transition of an ordinary star into a neutron star consisting mainly of neutrons. Such a star may possess a very small radius and an extremely high density. Okay? This is amazing. This is just extraordinary vision in 1934. And people started thinking about it after that, and it took a long time, you know, 30 or so years, for people to figure out observationally if neutron stars really did exist in the universe. So to do that, Jocelyn Bell, a young student at that time, with her advisor, Anthony Hewish, put together a telescope. This doesn't look much like a telescope. This looks like 100 posts that have been put into the ground, and they have about 120 miles of cable, and that's how they built radio detectors back then. And she discovered periodic pulses of extraterrestrial origin. So, you know, at that time, if you got something periodic, pretty rapid from the sky, there were really just two options, right? Either there was an interesting civilization, in fact, Jocelyn Bell called them the little green men, that was trying to communicate with us, or the only other option that physicists had thought about that could spin rapidly and emit light in these pulses were these things called neutron stars, also known as pulsars, and this led to the discovery of pulsars in 1967. So, it took 30 years for an idea that was, you know, just came out of just a man's brilliance to be translating into something really observable. And soon after it was observed, we began to understand that these were really extreme objects. Because if you want something spinning as rapidly as we were watching them spin, they had to be small and they had to be dense. So neutron stars are pretty extreme. We're talking about a solar mass, the mass that's contained in our sun, maybe between one and two times the mass of the sun. We think neutron stars probably exist in this range. And we think their radii are about 10 to 15 kilometers. So if the center of the neutron star was here, the surface would be closer than snow mass village. That's how small they are. We, we pack the entire sun between here and snow mass village. Okay? So what does that mean? Uh, Enrico gave us a, a very nice example of what density means. So just take that mass, calculate the volume, you know how, what the radius is, and you end up with a number that's 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube. That's, you know, 10 with 14 zeros. That really doesn't mean very much. So let's think about it. One teaspoon is about a billion tons. What is a billion tons? That's about 10,000 aircraft carriers, or 1,000 pyramids in Egypt. So that's pretty dense stuff, okay? And what do physicists do when they're given something extreme? You know, they're not, they're not satisfied with just having one extreme object. The first thing that occurs to them is, what can we do by smashing two of them together? So while, if you know physicists, you'll be aware that there is one quality that we're all very proud of. That is this childish curiosity that if you give us anything interesting, we're either going to take it apart or smash it together. <laughs> okay? The only problem now is, how are you going to find two neutron stars and smash them together? So if you think about this, we have to ask, somewhere in nature, neutron stars are being made, but we're not satisfied with one of them. We need to make two of them. Luckily, the majority of massive stars are in binaries. So more than half the stars that will eventually go supernova, as Zwicky and Bade predicted, will be in binaries. So that's good for us. So one of them, on about a 10 million year time scale, one of them goes supernova. You got your first neutron star. You wait maybe another few million years, the second one goes supernova. And then there are a lot of people here in Aspen at this workshop who are trying to figure out what fraction of these will actually produce neutron stars that are close enough together that they will eventually merge during the age of the universe. So that's not easy to do. So even though massive binaries are pretty common, Getting them to merge is very difficult. It's something that we're still trying to figure out. And our best expectation is, in our galaxy, you can expect one of these mergers every 100,000 years. So most people would just give up and say, you know, I'm not going to wait around 100,000 years. But, you know, astronomers are brilliant. They say, oh, 100,000 years in a galaxy? We just need to see 100,000 galaxies. So if you can build a detector that can see a million galaxies, no problem. You'll see 10 a year. So people start figuring out what they need to do to actually observe this. And to do that, we have to look at the last few seconds of the evolution of this binary. 
So during the last few seconds of this evolution, these objects get so close together that they radiate intense amounts of gravitational radiation. So here's a simulation that's showing the kind of gravitational waves that are being emitted. There was a nice discussion in the cafe just half an hour ago where people were asking about gravitational waves, and these are those same gravitational waves. Ripples in space-time that are coming to us from very distant mergers such as these, and it turns out we can build detectors that can see more than a million galaxies and catch one of those neutron star mergers if they ever did happen there. So this led to, over many decades, brilliant people to put together two instruments, one in Livingston and another one in Hanford, which is in my home state of Washington. And these interferometers, the technology that goes into these interferometers is just science fiction. It's amazing. You, you need to have a talk about them all together. All I can tell you is that these amazing detectors have the reach to see a million galaxies. And with those, we expect a few detections every year. So this led to the Nobel Prize just in 2017 for a, three brilliant people, one of them who came up with the design, a person who actually put together the team that built and ran these detectors, and the intellectual father of all of that pushed these ideas through Kip Thorne because they found gravitational waves, both from black holes and neutron stars. They finally, finally used this instrument to observe the universe. But in addition to these gravitational waves, we've been having these amazing leaps in technology that's helped us build telescopes. So we have this great set of telescopes all around the world. You know, it's been 400 years since Galileo discovered the simple telescope he could see the moon. But with these telescopes, you can see out to a million galaxies again. So whatever happens in gravitational waves, you can go and follow it up with some of these if you, if you, had, if you had the uh, signal to look for it. So we have, in addition to optical telescopes, we have telescopes like this one in New Mexico, which looks for radio waves. We have, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope up in, up in the sky looking for optical light. And we also have telescopes that look for very high frequency electromagnetic radiation like X-rays, gamma rays. Uh, we have a satellite called Fermi, which does this. So we were pretty ready to watch a neutron star merger in gravitational waves and in light with all these amazing instruments at our, at our disposal. And it, we didn't have to wait long. I mean, if you, have, if you have the instruments, nature will provide, okay? And so in, on August 17, 2017, the era of time domain astronomy began. We had seen neutrinos from the sun, and we'd seen light from the sun, so we had used more than one messenger to study a, a stellar object. But this was the first time we did this in real time. And this was exciting. So what happened was Fermi, this observatory that looks for gamma rays, on August 17, 1241 GMT, saw a gamma ray burst. And they found that this was really close by. They sent out an alert to everybody else to go look in the sky to see if they could follow it up. That was 14 seconds later. And then six minutes later, the people at LIGO were analyzing their data, and they noticed two seconds before the gamma ray burst, they had seen a neutron star, something that looked like a neutron star merger. So they sent out their notice telling people that they should start looking for it. And the hunt was on. Now people wanted to find this invisible light. So people all around the globe who had telescopes had to go look somewhere. The sky is a pretty big place. But because they had information of where it was on the sky, so Fermi itself gave us a big patch like that. LIGO gave us a, a, a swath like that. And LIGO and Virgo together gave a very small spot of the sky that allowed us to locate just a small region to go searching and the astronomers who first found it were the astronomers who were part of the 1M2H team working at the Carnegie Observatories in Las Campanas. So the team that was led by Ryan Foley, he's somewhere here in the audience, beat everybody else in the world to make this discovery. And, and here is a, a picture of Enrico with the team, and many of them are probably in the audience, so you should try to find them after the talk and congratulate them on finding the very first neutron star merger in visible light. But let me go back and show you what's interesting about this light. So when they first spotted it on August 17th, it looked blue, 
And then they waited a few more days, and the same thing looked red. And this will have implications that I'll mention later in the talk. So taken together, we saw a merger in gravitational waves. We saw a gamma ray burst. And then a few days, we watched it, and we saw visible light coming out. And all, all of this made sense. I mean, the theoreticians had already calculated what would happen if such a merger ha was to occur, and the sequence of events made sense. So it was telling us a story that we expected. It was interesting, and it was consistent. So we could measure the distance to that. Just think about this for a moment. It's 130 million light years away. And we are observing two tiny objects, 10 kilometers in radius, 130 million light years away. And what we're seeing here is the gravitational waves, the frequency with which the gravitational waves come in. The frequency increases until it merges. Then about two seconds later, Fermi satellite sees a spike of gamma rays coming from it. And then they watch it for days in visible light where it turns from being blue to, 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 about, to more reddish color. So this whole sequence of events that are going on made perfect sense. So these are simulations. There's the in-spiral phase where two neutron stars come together, produce a lot of radiation. There's a violent phase where they smash into each other. They oscillate. They eject material. This whole thing probably takes about 10 milliseconds. And then you have a post-merger where the gamma ray burst is ejected and more material is thrown into the universe on time scales of, say, seconds. So what did it help us address? So watching interesting things happen in the sky is great, but we also want to address some fundamental questions that have been with us for decades. So here are some big questions that this helped us address. We are now able to understand what powers some of the most big explosions, like the gamma ray bursts. What are the states of matter encountered inside these very dense objects that are called neutron stars? And where and how are the heavy elements produced, elements like gold, platinum, and uranium? So when, if I was to pull this room, I'm pretty sure that everybody would want to know this, even though these, the source is probably 130 million light years away. So this is an interesting question, because it asks us, why does the universe have to go to these extremes to make these heavy elements? And to do that, I need to take you on a short detour into the micro world, into the microscopic world of elementary particles. So did I mention that we like smashing things together? And this started in 1900. So Rutherford was looking at what happens to charged particles when they collide on a foil of gold. And what he discovered was that, for the most part, the charged particles just went right through gold. Very occasionally, one of them would come flying back at him. And it was pretty clear that atoms were pretty empty. So in fact, one of his uh, colleagues states, solid matter is transparent to charged particles. The space occupied by one cubic meter of solid platinum, he was probably doing experiments on platinum while Rutherford was working with gold, interesting choice of uh, targets, uh, is as empty as the space between the stars and the Earth. So this is remarkable, because this is the first time we began to understand that the atom is big. Okay. And the atom is big because all the particles that it's shooting at is going right through. And occasionally, when it hits the nucleus, it comes flying back at you. So a big empty atom, again, I've chosen gold as an example here, 79 protons, 118 neutrons, all stuck in a, in a very small space, one ten thousandth of the volume of the whole atom. And the electrons are in this big orbits around this. So there's a 10,000 scale of 10,000 difference between the nucleus and, and the atom. So if you ask what is the density of an atom, it's one gram per centimeter cube. The reason everything in this room is a density of a few grams per centimeter cube is because an atom is a few grams per centimeter cube. So we, we live at atomic densities. But really, matter in the atom is filling the region where if you ask what the density is, that's 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube. Remember, I told you that the neutron star was 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube. So we got a little piece of a neutron star inside every atom. Okay? And it's, in fact, by studying some of this that we have confidence in extrapolating our knowledge to neutron stars. So I should also tell you the simple question, why is the atom big, gave birth to quantum mechanics. So if you think about it, the electron is negatively charged. The atom is positively charged. Why isn't the electron sitting on right on top of the, the positively charged nucleus? 
To answer that, they had to invent quantum mechanics, and here's a picture of Bohr and Heisenberg. There's an interesting history to it uh, that may, many of you may have heard uh, associated with the Second World War. But here, I just want to talk about their discovery of quantum mechanics. So if I were to simplify quantum mechanics, I, I would say quantum mechanics involves all particles with two qualities. It makes them claustrophobic, and a large fraction of them are pretty asocial. So they tend to move faster if you confine them into very small spaces, or if you make them get into very high densities. They don't like each other, so they, they get very agitated. We call that quantum pressure. So atom is as big as it is because of these two properties. Okay? And it'll turn out that these two properties also do interesting things in stars. And the lighter the particle is, the more excitable they are. So the electron is much more claustrophobic and much more asocial than the neutrons and the protons. So the particle revolution, I'm sure you've heard some talks. People are not happy to just discover neutrons and protons and electrons. They said, what happens if we smash things at even larger energies? So in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we built massive accelerators that collided particles together to see if it had any substructure. So here's a picture of the biggest collider we have now. But preceding this, there were efforts in the US like Fermilab, Stanford, Brookhaven that collided particles together and came up with interesting new insights. We realized that neutrons and protons, in fact, had substructure. Inside a neutron, there were quarks. And there were different kinds of quarks. And then they made bigger experiments, and these bigger experiments revealed a whole family of particles, much heavier than the quarks that are present inside a nucleon. And we began to realize that there's a huge particle zoo, and remarkably, we can understand all of these particles with one unifying theory called the standard model. So this particle journey that we've taken in told us these particles exist. So how are we going to go from these particles to making gold? So do that, we back to talking about the big scale, the universe. So when the universe started, we all heard that there was a big bang, created a very hot plasma, and when you think about what it created, there was so much energy that it was able to create all the particles that we've seen in these big accelerator experiments. The big quarks, the small quarks, the leptons, the neutrinos, everything was there in the early universe. And then it cooled. As it cooled, some of these heavy, element, heavy particles decayed because they were not favorable at these lower temperatures. So, for example, the bottom quark, which is here, is missing in this picture here. And so we lost some of the heavy quarks, we lost some of the other heavy particles, and you're left with a plasma of quarks, and you're left with electrons, muons, a few neutrinos, lots of photons. And then when the universe cooled further, it finally made the objects that we have in the world today. It made neutrons, protons, leptons, et cetera. So we had to wait about a microsecond before we could create all the particles that exist today. And if you notice, the temperatures here, that's 10 to the 12 Kelvin. That's 10 billion Kelvin. And we had to wait to 10 billion Kelvin to start forming nuclei. If you look at this figure, the first thing that should strike you is there are fewer neutrons than protons. Okay? And that's a, that's a really important thing to remember. There aren't enough neutrons there compared to the protons. In fact, for every neutron, there are six protons. And why is that? It's because neutrons are just a little bit heavier than the proton. And also because the neutrons can decay to produce protons. So what can you do uh, if you cool the system further? The first thing you do is the nuclear force wants to bring neutrons and protons to gather together. That's, that's, that's very attractive. So you produce these atoms called helium atoms. And now if you look at the gas, everything else is just protons. So you're in a, you're in a fix. You have these charged particles that can't form any more because they are, the, the universe is cooling, and you can't make any heavier nuclei because the making a heavy nucleus is hard. And the reason it's hard is because if I take two of these alpha particles, as we call them, which exist in the early universe and tries to fuse it, they repel each other because they're both positively charged. So you need a lot of time and a lot of heat, a lot of high temperature to be able to do that. And even if you did that, you could only fuse up to iron. This was also something that was being discussed in the cafe. And the reason you only get up to iron is because fusion beyond iron is not energetically favorable. 
So while you can put two of these together and form a new object that has less energy, you can't put two ion atoms together and get some energy out of it. The only way to get to these heavier systems is to find a way to get a lot of neutrons. So if you had a lot of neutrons, you can keep adding them because these neutrons are not electrically charged and you can make big nuclei. So now we want to make gold, we got to go find the neutrons, okay? So let's figure out how we are going to find the neutrons in the universe. So if you think about what a star does, it does fusion. It's, a, it's an efficient fusion factory. So if you look at the interior of a big star, you'll see pretty much fusion going on in every location except the core. Because the core, matter is already fused to form iron, and the iron no longer wants to fuse. So there's fusion of neon going on here. There's, uh, in the outer regions, hydrogen is fusing to form helium, and you create this nice onion skin structure. And uh, in the 1920s, people, uh, Chandrasekhar, who was thinking about what happens to very dense matter, made of electrons and, and protons came up with the idea that you can't support this core with just the quantum pressure of electrons, the same pressure I talked about that exists in an atom. He, know, he did a calculation and he said 1.4 solar masses. That's as much as you can support with the electron quantum pressure. So I want you to remember that, 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Anything bigger than that, that core is going to implode. And in fact, the implosion of that core is what produces a core collapse supernova. So when the core implodes through a mechanism that we are still grappling with, the whole star explodes but leaves behind a neutron star at its center. So you took a core that was probably 1,500 kilometers in radius and crunched it down to 10 kilometers. Okay? So when that happens, something interesting happens to the nucleus. So you're compressing, and when you compress, these electrons are getting more and more agitated. They're getting higher and higher energy, and they can start making neutrons for you. Because if you have a very high energy electron, it will go strike a proton there and say, turn it into a neutron, because it's much better that way. Instead of having a high energy electron, you'd have a low energy proton. So this conversion begins, and it starts making neutrons for you again. So, it was pretty clear at this time that neutron stars contain neutrons because of this process where electrons turn protons into neutrons. And Oppenheimer, who was of course well known for leading the Manhattan Project and helped, helped develop the atomic bomb, uh, was thinking about other things as well. He was thinking about what happens to neutrons when they get very dense. And he was the first one to calculate the object that we call a neutron star. He just made the assumption that let's assume a neutron star just contain neutrons. And let's assume that all we need is the quantum pressure of these neutrons. How big of a star can I keep? And his calculation suggested that the quantum pressure will support 0.8 solar masses. And what was the mass of the object that formed this? 1.4 solar masses. So if Oppenheimer was right, we wouldn't have neutron stars. Every time an uh, iron core collapsed, we would make a black hole, right? And we wouldn't have our neutrons. So that's the reason I call this the cosmic catastrophe. Because if Oppenheimer was right, we wouldn't have any gold. Okay? But fortunately, people took this seriously and they said, in fact, you know, we can't just approximate the neutron star as a gas of neutrons. There's a lot of interesting nuclear physics that's going on in there. And, uh, and people worked on it and they realized that in fact, the neutron star is a pretty complex beast. When you're at the surface, the density is not very high. As you go through to a depth of, say, uh, 10 meters, then you start to see interesting things happen, where you see electrons pushing protons into neutrons, and you develop all of these very neutron-rich nuclei. These nuclei contain large numbers of neutrons. And then, at some point, you have so many neutrons that you can't keep them inside a nucleus, and you, these neutrons start dripping out. And if you go further to about, say, a kilometer and a half into the neutron star, you see that almost everything is neutrons. You get to 90% neutrons. So here, at a depth of, say, 100 meters, you have 70% neutrons. At a depth of a kilometer, you have 80% neutrons. And in the, neutron, in the core of the neutron star, you have more than 90%. But at some point, the neutron star is going to have densities where it's going to squeeze the nucleons together and liberate the quarks, because inside those nucleons were the quarks. So deep inside, there are these quarks that we're still trying to figure out how to tease out from observations. 
So if you think back about the history of this, in the 70s and 80s, many people would come to Aspen Center for Physics to think about interesting issues about dense matter. And Gordon Boehm, who's here, actually in the audience, was one of the pioneers to start understanding why the nuclear physics of neutron stars are very different from what Oppenheimer thought. So this complexity of the neutron star was, is shown in this figure here, where as you go from the surface down to the center, you get many phases. And most importantly, in this region where you have lots of neutrons and protons, they figured out that there are repulsive forces between the neutrons that keep these neutrons apart. So these repulsive forces increase the maximum mass of a neutron star. Instead of supporting 0.8 solar masses, they're now able to support two solar masses. And this was crucial to understand for the stability of neutron stars and thus averting this uh, catastrophe. So we have neutrons now. Okay? We, we, we have neutrons. All we need to make is gold. So why is this tricky? Okay? So when you have neutrons in a neutron star, the hard part is getting them out. The gravity in a neutron star is just immense. So if you want to get something out, you have to be traveling at about a third of the speed of, uh, speed of light to get out of there. So the escape velocity is 0.3 of the speed of light. So getting them out is hard, but neutron stars experience some violent uh, encounters. For example, when the neutron star is born, it's very hot because it was born in a supernova explosion, and there are lots of neutrinos that come out of this hot object. The photons don't go anywhere because it's so dense. It's only the neutrinos that can come out, and those neutrinos blow a wind of material that comes out of the neutron star. So you can get matter out of the neutron star, but there's just one problem. Neutrinos are really good at getting rid of neutrons. A neutrino can turn a neutron into a proton. So if you want to get the neutrons out of this hot environment using neutrinos, by the time they come out, they're going to be protons. So for decades, we've tried to get the supernova to make gold, and, unsuccess un and unsuccessfully, because ultimately, we couldn't beat this reaction. We couldn't figure out a way around this. Okay, so this is you know, using large simulations, lots of theory. And in fact, when I was a graduate student, nobody ever talked about this that I'm about to mention. Everybody was working on this and trying to make gold from supernova, and it didn't work. The second, the second option is to use two neutron stars. So the two neutron star option is the neutron star merger. And we found that as soon as you did some of these simulations, we began to realize that this was very robust. We always got the neutrons up, whereas this was very fragile. So in this case, Getting, to, getting some of the matter out is, is, is still a little bit tricky, and we're working on it, but at least we have the angular momentum. When two particles come together, there's a lot of forces acting on it, and some of it can just get squeezed out by the tidal forces. When they slam into each other, they produce enough heat so that thermal energy can again go into blowing, it goes into blowing some of this. And all of the simulations that we have to date predict, in fact, that neutron-rich material comes out of it. And so we are pretty confident, both from theory and now from observations, that neutron star mergers do eject lots of neutrons. So this was, again, this, there's a connection to Aspen. Dave Schramm was a longtime visitor at Aspen, and he and his student, Jim Latimer, in the 1970s were the first to propose that maybe we should be looking at neutron star mergers. And Dave Schramm unfortunately passed away, in fact, on his way to uh, Aspen about 20 years ago. But if he was around, he would really be delighted that you know, his idea that neutron star mergers would produce gold is, in fact, come out to be true. So we've spent maybe the last year or so interpreting the signal that we've seen from this interesting uh, collision. And what we've seen is the gravitational waves, and people have worked really hard at trying to figure out what this signal means. It means that the neutron stars, the sum of the neutron stars that were involved in this collision, have a sum of those two masses is 2.7. There's a small error maybe in the second or de se third decimal point. We know that the radius of these neutron stars must be less than 13.5 kilometers. And all of this because there's a worldwide effort of observers, theorists, computational astrophysicists working hard to figure out how to go from this data to insights about what's going on and what these properties are. 
The other interesting insight from just looking at the light curves that Ryan Foley and his team and other teams around the world found is that to produce the light we saw, we had to eject about 5% of the mass of the sun into, into powering this light curve. So that if you just translate that into how much gold was produced in that event to produce this light curve, you come up with 100 Earth masses of gold. Okay? So that's a lot of gold, just 130 million light years away. Okay? Now, I want to leave you with this final thought. Think about this. There are two neutron stars that collided in a faraway galaxy. The collision had enough energy to rip the top two kilometers, so it's like blast mining a neutron star, to get about 0.05 solar masses, you really have to strip the last two kilo, the outer two kilometers of the neutron star. And that's where you get all the neutrons. And, and then we need nuclear reactions, which we study in the laboratory, to do the rest. Once you get these neutrons, what happens subsequently is pretty well understood. There are experiments ongoing to make, you know, to clear out all the details, but we now have a pretty confident that, you know, the outer two kilometers of the neutron star is being ripped apart in these collisions, and very heavy elements are being made. So next time you look at gold and you wonder why it's precious, just think about this. 79 protons, 180 neutrons in every gold nucleus were once all neutrons and they were swimming deep inside a neutron star, and they did that for about 100 million years. Okay, it is precious indeed. So this is something, when you think about why is gold, you know, why we all think some of these elements are precious, of course we pay a lot of money for it. But the reason they're, in my mind, they're really precious is because the universe has to go to extremes to make this. And here's, here's, my, uh, here's a, a, a little image that tells you you have to go to extremes to produce gold or any of the heavy elements. So that's my final thought that I want to share with you. And this has been an incredible journey, not only for theorists and observers, but for many people who've been watching this develop. So uh, with that, I want to conclude, uh, conclude this talk. But... I think this is just the beginning, because we've only seen one neutron star merger. And our colleagues who are doing gravitational wave astronomy, our colleagues who are building telescopes, tell us that we'll see a few every year. And there are exciting times ahead. I thank you very much for your attention. It, it seems like these uh, neutron stars are pretty energetic animals and they're casting out lots of light and radiation. How do they evolve and what is their fate? Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. I spent some of my time before this exciting event, I spent a large fraction of my time just looking at isolated neutron stars or neutron stars in binaries uh, to kind of see what they do and interpret what we're seeing. So if you just take a neutron star in isolation, a neutron star is born hot. On a time scale of, say, 100 seconds, it gets cold. You can watch it for a million years after that because it emits X-rays from the surface. And that million-year time scale is set by the ability of the neutron star to cool by emitting neutrinos. It's so dense, it can't cool by emitting photons. So it has to, we have to understand how neutron stars can make neutrinos so that they can cool in a million years. So that's their evolution, if they were just a single object. So after a million years, you stop seeing them. They're just too hard to see. Some other neutron stars are interesting. They make these pulsars, and that's how Jocelyn Bell was able to see them. But they get kind of uninteresting after a million years or so, because they get cold and go away. But interestingly, some of them are in a binary. So even though they get very cold, matter from the binary keeps falling on them, and they have thermonuclear explosions. They have hydrogen bombs going off on, their, on the surface 
every hour. So there are X-ray satellites looking at a neutron star, seeing a thermonuclear explosion at 2 o'clock, come back, look at 3 o'clock, oh, there's another one. And then, you know, you can come back three days later, there's another one every hour. So they do really exciting things when they're in binaries. At the beginning of the talk, you said that um, binary uh, neutron stars rotate around each other at the speed of light. Is it the speed of light or just really close to the speed of light? Good question. <laughs> close to the speed of light. So uh, you can roughly estimate how fast they're moving when they're almost about to touch, and that's maybe 50% of the speed of light. So in fact, if you just dropped anything on the neutron star, when it hits the neutron star, it'll be at about 30 to 50 percent of the speed of light. When the uh, neutron stars merge, in your graphic there you showed it almost has like a, a, a dipole configuration. Can you give the layman's explanation why that happens? So there is a plane of the orbit where all of the angular momentum is. So they, they merge, in, and, and much of the light comes out in, in, in the plane that's perpendicular to it. Because the, it, the electromagnetic radiation that we see as a burst needs to form, and to form, it can't have a lot of matter around it. So in the plane of the merger, there's a lot of matter. So usually all of the, all of the dynamics that generates the burst is perpendicular to it. That's why you see this funnel coming out of the plane of that orbit. If we ramp it up from a neutron star to a black hole, does the black hole absorb the neutron star and it's all ne negative after that? Uh, sorry, you'll have to repeat the question. If, if we ramp this up to a black hole and a neutron star right. merging. Right. That, that if you had a black hole and a neutron star merging, which we are hoping to see very shortly, you eject a lot more of the material depending on the mass of the black hole and the neutron star. If the mass of the black hole is too big, it's not good for ejecting material, but it might be very interesting to study what the neutron star is doing as it gets close to the object. Is that just the accretion? Yes. How do you measure the density of a neutron star? That's a good question. Um, if you could measure the radius of the neutron star, we have very interesting, accurate ways to measure the mass of the neutron star, because whenever neutron stars are in binaries, we can study the orbit of the binary, and we can look for very interesting deviations from just Newtonian physics that allows us to tease out the masses of these objects. I would recommend that you go look up on Wikipedia the masses of these objects measured by looking at pulsar timing, by looking at the pulse timing. You can get four decimal points on the mass of an object. So you can measure neutron stars very accurately. So you know the mass. Now we've got to measure the radius. And that's been really hard because you're trying to measure something that's 10 kilometers that's very far away. But I mentioned in the end of my talk that we now know from just gravitational waves that the radius has to be less than 13 and a half kilometers. So you can use those two numbers to get a minimum density. Just divide the mass by the volume. And the reason gravitational waves gave us a bound on the upper limit on the radius is because neutron stars deform just so slightly as they start getting closer together because of tidal interactions. So during the last part of the merger, the neutron star deforms and the people measuring the gravitational waves can be sensitive to that slight deformation. And the amount of deformation is sensitive to how big the neutron star is. If it's very big, it deforms a lot. If it's very small, it doesn't deform. So by measuring the amount of deformation, they were able to tell us that the radius of the neutron star has to be less than 13 and a half kilometers. I 
everything was so clear. But, uh, any more questions? No? Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, so, so how many neutron stars we know about and how many neutron stars we think are in our own Milky Way? So we have seen about 2,000 neutron stars in our galaxy, and a lot of them are these pulsars. We've seen tens of isolated neutron stars. We've seen tens of neutron stars and binaries that are doing these thermonuclear explosions that I mentioned. But since every star that's maybe between mass of 10 solar masses and 25 solar masses we think has to leave behind a neutron star, we expect about a billion neutron stars to be there. And we don't see many of them, and that's understandable because after a million years, some of them just get too cold. The neutrinos cool them so rapidly that we don't get to see it. So we understand the fraction that we see and that we don't, we, we're not worried that we're not seeing a large population because that population is probably too cold to see unless they get into a binary or something like that. How about the thought that uh, these pulsars will be used in navigation uh, throughout the universe in the future. That's the one thing that we can see at quite a distance that stays put in that particular location and we can coordinate ourselves off of that. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a brilliant thought. And people have been thinking, because neutron stars are great clocks. And you know, if you think back about navigation, clocks are the most crucial element. I mean, you know, if you go to, I don't know, if, if you think about the history of navigation by sea, the most important discovery was the clock that helped you navigate. So you have these clocks in, in space, and I, I think someday people are going to use it precisely for what you're talking about. But for now, no. But we still use, but we want to use the pulsars to measure a different type of gravitational waves which have very low frequency. And, and, and that might be what we see first before we use space travel and pulsars as, uh, as lighthouses. Okay, so um, earlier you mentioned that, or just a couple questions ago, that uh, the million, million years when a neutron star cools, if they get in a pair, then would it reheat up? Yes, it would. Uh, we see very old uh, neutron stars that are reheated because they, they are in a pair and they are, they are getting material from a companion. And, uh, and sometimes you see them get hot, get cold, and, and uh, people uh, work on trying to predict uh, after every time they accrete a little bit of matter how much hotter they should be, and that way study the properties of the neutron star. I have another question. Uh, and there's also oh, a question down here. That's more important. Although he's a colleague, so I don't know if he's allowed to ask a question. <laughs> question to another colleague. So you made an interesting comment, you know, once we as humans have some uh, observatories in place, nature will give us some interesting things to see. Somehow there is a positive conspiracy between our wishes and uh, what uh, nature gives us. So what is on your wish list for uh, the next uh, observation? On Earth? Yeah, I take my vitamin pills because I want to be around when the galactic supernova goes off. The supernova goes off in our galaxy every 30 or so years, they tell us. And I, when I was a graduate student, this is more than 20 years ago, my thesis advisor said, you should work on supernovae. And I said, great. And I got my PhD thesis, and then somebody said, why are you working on supernovae? They occur only once every 30 years. But um, they're fascinating. We're going to see neutrinos. We're going to see gravitational waves. And we're going to see a lot of light and uh, physicists will be busy for decades. And we, we will understand a lot more about neutron star interiors. And for example, we now think supernovae don't make gold. We don't think it's a good site to make heavy elements. Maybe by looking at those observations, we'll have to revisit some of those theories. And we have neutrino detectors that can tell us whether or not neutrinos are doing bad things to those neutrons that are coming out. So that will be my number one on my wish list.
so you told us that uh, neutrons and protons are in fact not elementary. Uh, so uh, do we know anything about quark stars? Yeah, we've speculated for a long time that maybe uh, some class of neutron stars actually f convert from nuclear matter to quark matter. And uh, these ideas are something that we are constantly trying to either prove or disprove using observations. So far, everything that we've seen observationally about neutron stars are entirely consistent with them having neutrons outside and perhaps quarks inside. And this perhaps quarks inside is a, is a question that's dear to many people, including Gordon here uh, and myself. But how do you discover what's in the center of an object that has a density of 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter? You can't see into it. You've got to come up with some really clever ways to tease out what's happening at the core of a neutron star. And we have some ideas. So, you know, in the next decade or so, we may make that leap and understand what's actually happening in the core of a neutron star. Um, you may have said this and I missed it, but uh, why was it blue and then the light became red? It's a great question. I didn't answer it, but you give me now the opportunity to do that. So when you make, what is it that's producing the light? So you ejected material from the neutron star, a lot of radioactive nuclei were formed, and those radioactive nuclei decay. And when they decay, they produce light. The light rescatters on all of those nuclei, and then finally when it can come out, it comes out with a certain color, okay? And the color depends on the type of nuclei that you have. So if you have ion atoms there, they're not very good at absorbing a lot of light. So the blue light comes out of the iron atoms pretty easily. But if I have a heavier atom, like gold or uranium, they're really good at absorbing this light because they have a lot of electrons around them. So every time light goes through it, one of those electrons just picks up the light. So if the material has mostly gold or uranium or platinum, the light that comes out has to be red because the blue light never makes it out of that. But if it's iron, the blue light comes out. So the stuff that you see in blue is probably making iron-like stuff, and the stuff that was red is the indication that you made heavy elements. That is the smoking gun that told us that we really did make some very heavy elements. So a follow-up question to his is, does the iron retain the red light, or is the blue light more prevalent? Sorry, you have to repeat that question. Okay, so he asked uh, when the blue light and red light comes out. Right. And you said that the iron that's the blue light out, does it retain the red light, or is the blue light right. more prevalent? No, that's a great question. So uh, the, the red light comes out later when it gets a little bit colder. So if you got the blue light already, then you know there's no red light to come out because it's already got cold. So it's not, it's whatever light comes out first from that region is, is going to be the dominant light that you see. By the way, the two of you are asking some great questions. <laughs> Maybe as we finish the night, can you tell us, so you told us, you know, a hundred Earth masses of gold were made in the universe and were far away. Right. Can you guide us a little bit about how the gold ultimately got to Earth? Yeah, this is, this is a tough question because uh, I think we're still trying to figure this out, how the gold that's made in a specific event gets mixed and then, you know, becomes part of a solar system. How is it distributed? Uh, so this is an area that is actively being pursued by others. I'm not an expert on this, but every uh, one of these explosive events produces elements and that is recycled. It goes into making other stars and then the solar systems and some of the solar systems are made with this cosmic dust that contains these heavy elements. So another way to look for signatures of heavy elements that people have done for a long time before we saw the neutron star merger was to go out and look at the surfaces of many stars and see what's the composition of that. So by doing you know, this kind of forensic study, you go to the surface of different stars in the galaxy, different stars in satellite galaxies and see what kind of metals they have, they they have an understanding of when those metals may have formed. For example, supernova happen very frequently, and they happen pretty early in the universe. 
So you should see very early stars. If you see very early stars with a lot of heavy elements, then it's telling you that maybe supernovae also make heavy elements. So that's not entirely ruled out yet because neutron stars take a long time to turn on. So if you see old stars with heavy elements, then it's giving us a little bit of a pause to think maybe supernova or some rare supernova produce it. So we've been trying to put all of this together. There may be other people in the audience who have other insights on distribution of these elements in, in, uh, in different stars that can add to this, but that's our current understanding. Okay, on that note, let's thank Sanjay again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for coming.